let's talk a little bit about design controls. It's something that we all hear being in the medical device industry, and it's really kind of a what are they moment. So design controls is really a set of practices and procedures that you follow to document your design and to show that you are building your design in an iterative and controlled fashion. There's not a whole bunch that's written about it. A lot of it is written in the preamble to the QSR, which not many people read. It's quite a bit longer than the actual QSR itself. And so it's kind of this area where we hear a lot of phrases, but we don't know how to do it practically. And we're going to take you through what that is and what we can do to help prevent future issues with your design and improve on technologies that are in the market. Just to go back and, and for me to get on my soapbox for a minute about the, the preamble, because it's extremely relevant right now, because the FDA just published what they call the quality management system regulation or the QMSR instead of the QSR, which is the quality system regulation. And that's where they are proposing harmonization with ISO 13485. And those of you who are familiar with ISO 13485, risk is integrated pretty much throughout the total product life cycle. But in the original QSR, they mentioned risk one time in the context of V and V activities. And they say in the quality management system regulation, if you were to actually read the text, they said, well, like we said in the preamble, and they list about a half dozen comments that they made about risk in the preamble, which is just their explanation of what they were thinking when they wrote the regulation. It's not regulation themselves. And so they're like, so, so clearly we've, we've meant this since 1996, 1997, when the, the regulations were originally published. So that's just a little bit of context around where we're going to go with the design controls and then the risk management module. Yeah, yeah, it's a really uh, active topic right now, as Michelle mentioned, because they just published that, which is something that has been a rumor in industry for many, many years and actually kind of came out. And there's a lot of uh, nebulousness about how that's going to be implemented because we'll talk about, you know, certain people have design controls and certain people are exempt and all of that. We always see what's kind of a traditional waterfall process, but what we don't see is what a design controls are not. And they're not your 510K. They don't mean that you have market clearance. They're not your patent. It's a process. It has a bunch of documentation that comes that's part of the outputs. And it starts with user needs, which feed into design inputs. And those inputs then feed design outputs. And then you verify that your outputs are meeting your inputs. And then you kind of get a medical device. And then you validate that that medical device meets your user needs and you actually built the right device. And then from there, you go through this whole process and you get to design transfer and you're like, oh, I got to send that to manufacturing and somehow mass market and produce it. And that's kind of the traditional process, but there's a whole bunch of steps there. So it's not a 510K, it's not your patent. It's a huge series of process and the culmination of a lot of effort. So why do we do design controls? Well, Michelle mentioned risk and how in the preamble, there's a whole bunch of risk discussion, whereas in the QSR, which is the actual regulation, they mention it once, was software validations. And if you dig even deeper than that, there's hundreds of guidance documents on talking about how to incorporate risk and how to deal with risk. And the reason design controls and risk management is tied is because of all of the recalls that happen because designs are not inherently safe. And so almost all of, half of all recalls is because people aren't adequately designing things. They're not designing things safely. They're not designing things that are meeting the intended use or the indications for use. They get out on the market and then they cause patient injuries or harm. And that's what happens. And that's why design controls exist now. And so when they talk about that total product life cycle, things are supposed to obviously be inherently safe by design, 
but they're also supposed to, when you cause such an event, like one of these recalls or product failures on the market, theoretically, they're supposed to drive an improvement in your design and that design control cycle becomes iterative. Also, you can use adverse events from your competitors' products that should also be part of your post-market surveillance and then also feed your own design controls process. So when do you start these? So there's lots of different times that you start them. Like Michelle mentioned, it can be a mechanism of change or revision. So you might have released a product, notice that you were getting a lot of recalls, a lot of complaints, and you would be following your risk management process ultimately in a loop back to your design control process to make changes to your design. But really, if you're starting, if you're a biotech and you're starting fresh and you're a brand new medical device company, you should be starting your design controls right after feasibility or proof of concept. What you want to avoid is the trap of having a final finished product and then doing your design controls because then it's very retroactive work and it stinks. I have been here, we have done this. It's terrible to try and recreate a design history file after you've already finished everything out. Have to do it before you're on market. A lot of people think that they wanna have all the kinks nailed out because you don't wanna spend all this time documenting, but really you need to do that because you need to show evidence of your iterative design.